You're listening to Work It Lady, where the goal is for all ladies to be the best versions of ourselves. And if we happen to be moms, be the best moms ever and maintain our sanity while we do it. Okay, ladies, so today is going to be a totally different type of episode. Number one, if you are into history, you are absolutely going to love this, I hope. Um, I want to be sharing some things um, on my own um, family history and kind of highlighting um some of the effects of generational trauma that I've identified in my family um, by use of actually doing research um, in my family tree, kind of connecting the dots with some of the stories in my family with actual things that I was actually able to find um, through doing census uh, records and things like that with the use and help of, of course, Ancestry.com. Okay, so there is so much to cover. There's so much to say. And I think this is an important topic for women because we're mothers, right? And even if we don't have kids yet, it's still important for us to know that history about ourselves and, you know, who our parents' parents were and their parents' parents and their parents' parents and kind of putting that family picture together so that we can then um, have that self-awareness for ourselves, but then also passing that information on to our children children, the next generation. So I love talking about this stuff. I am a huge history nerd. Okay. So this is like something I just really enjoy doing. So, um, but first I want to kind of just talk about first generational trauma and I feel like that's kind of a new word out there in society. And I want to kind of clearly define what generational trauma is. Um, so Duke University has a definition that I really, really, really like. It says intergenerational trauma is a concept developed to help explain years of generational challenges within families. It is a transmission or sending down to younger generations of oppressive or traumatic effects of a historical event. So um, I think that's a great uh, definition um, and, and, and a lot of different types of trauma can fall into that definition. It could be domestic violence, it could be alcohol, alcohol abuse, uh, child abuse, um, you know, um, just economic challenges, you know, um, all of those things can be things that if we're not careful, we can actually pass on. And so I think it's important to kind of sit down and we're able to do this now in modern times. And we're able to, you know, look at lives on paper and actually pinpoint and look at, oh, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Wow, this was kind of an interesting situation. Mm. And so I think it's just so important to do that, okay? Now, there's another definition of generational trauma that I also like from goodtherapy.org. It says intergenerational trauma may be transmitted through parenting behaviors, challenges, changes, excuse me, and gene expression and or pathways that we have yet to understand fully. These may be biological, social, physiological, and a mixture of the three. And I like that definition because, you know, from a social aspect, we definitely pass down certain, you know, um, traits or cultural traits or, you know, behavior patterns within families. Those things do get passed along. And then even from the biological standpoint, you know, um, certain families that live in different areas may have only had access to certain types of food and that food becomes part of your biological person and so then that even gets passed on to the next generation but you may have only had access to those certain foods because of your economic oppressive state so it's important to understand hey all these things boil together to form a picture and it's important to kind of dissect each one and see, you know, how they affect us and, and how, what, what we can do better and what can we learn. So um, 
of course, during this month, okay, of February, right now, of course, the lives of Black Americans um, are kind of being highlighted. And I think it's nice to do that every now and then because we do have a a different history, you know, in this country. And I, I think it's important for everyone, not just Black Americans, but everyone to kind of understand that history and know um, what some of the challenges may be so that we all just understand one another. So actually on healthline.com, there was an interesting article that was actually published last year. And it says Black families have inherited trauma, but we could change that says, when I look at my life, my family and community, I wonder which pattern are authentically ours and which are a result of cultural post-traumatic stress disorders, okay? So it says, our ancestors' trauma lives on. During my exploration, I came across a work of Dr. Joy DeGroy. She's a clinical psychologist with a doctoral in social work research and author of the book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. And the article goes on to make a lot of really, really good points. So um, I will try to remember to link this article in this episode um, because I'm going to be covering so much information here. I, I don't have the time to go through um, this whole article right now, but I do think that it's a really good read and that you should take um, a look at it. It makes a lot of good points. Uh, it kind of touches on the fact that, yes, we did have these traumas. Out of some of these trauma came great things like our ability to overcome challenges. Um, we're quite resilient and how we can continue on a path to healing. So definitely a good read um, that all women can benefit from. Okay. Now, Let's actually get into um, my family's pattern of some generational traumas that have happened. And um, I want to start by saying I really have always been interested in this from a young child because, of course, you hear your family stories and there were some quite interesting stories on my both sides of my family. And um, I just always had lots of questions and was left wondering about a lot of things. And so then this amazing TV series came out called Finding Your Roots, which we'll talk about at the end of this even more. But um, that kind of motivated me to do digging and research on my own family tree and just absolutely love it. So um, let's get into my family tree a little bit. Now, in this episode, I'm going to focus just on on one portion of my family tree. And at a later time, a later date, I may go on and do the other side and other portions of my family tree. But for today, I'm just going to focus on this one part. And this is actually going to be on my father's side of the family um, and tracing the line of uh, his mother and um, going through that route uh, through to my great great grandparents on that side. Okay. So now before I get started, I want to say I am going to kind of um, either just give you, you know, like abbreviations for people's names or not use their full names because while this is absolutely my story to tell and it's my family history you know it's not all mine to say you know there are some of my um family members that you know they're still living they're much older they're still living you know like they may not want like their names and stuff being used out there um you know so i don't want to just you know be putting everything out there. I want to be respectful um, to myself and to my family members and my ancestors as well, you know. So I'm going to give you as much information that you need to know, um, but just, you know, bear with me because I won't be sharing the full names and all that business, okay? Now, um, let's go ahead and get into this. So I've done all my research and everything on Ancestry.com years and years ago. I did one of their DNA tests and I'm thinking of even doing another one because now like they've improved um, all their like genetic mapping and everything that they do. So it's like even more detailed now than it was when I um, did my DNA test. Um, but 
It also gives you access to not only um, your, um, you know, genetic breakdowns and your DNA origins, but it also gives you like the ability to build your family tree by looking at, you know, birth and death dates and census records and, you know, social security numbers. So it really can give you a lot of information. Um, There's a lot of verifying that you have to do. It definitely like you could get legit lost in doing all this research and be up to like three in the morning <laughs> um, researching all of this, um, which is definitely what me and my husband have have done, you know, before we know it, it's like 4 a.m. and we're up still working on this stuff. So, um, but interestingly, I want to share a point there. Um, one of the generational traumas I, I even noticed in comparing my family with his family is, you know, he is able to kind of go back on his side and get like exact dates and names and times and go way, way back all the way to like the 1500s. But due to the fact that my family and um, on my side, I'm the descendants of slaves, there's just a lot of information that just completely isn't even available. So just that in itself just goes to, to speak to the point that, you know, the fact that because my family, you know, where it was enslaved, they're just the records weren't kept as well. Um, as we go through this, you'll see that names also um, weren't spelled correctly. There are birth dates that one time is this is a birthday, another time that is a birthday. And that's just because, you know, a lot of um, people who were laborers at that time were born on the farm um, and there was no formal birth record. So even um, my grandfather, whom I knew um, and and who um, passed away less than a decade ago, he didn't even know what his actual birth date was because although he was too young to be a slave, he was the descendants of slaves and um, he was born at home. So, you know, and he was you know, born kind of, you know, a while ago. So the records just were not kept as well on Black Americans as they were on white Americans. And so when you see that clearly spelled out on paper, it just kind of, it doesn't feel too good. It's just like, wow, you know, that's, that's the times. However, I really um, try not to let this information get me down or make me feel angry um, about, certain things, although it it could be very well understandable to be angry. I feel like this is history that we could just learn from and most importantly, learn how to just be better. That That's really all we can do. So, um, okay. So guys, if you are watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and see that this is actually a picture of my great grandmother and her brother here. And, um, Yeah, I just love this picture so much. Pro tip, if you have family members that um, have older pictures, and of course, you know, um, they were pretty guarded about those naturally so, or you don't want to damage them, you could just take a picture of it on your cell phone. That's what I do. And this is a picture that I snapped um, a while ago, actually. And I'm so happy that I did because I have this picture of my great grandmother and her brother. So um, yeah, this is Mama Q right here, my great grandmother, my grandmother's mother. And here is a picture of my great grandfather. So this is Mama Q's husband okay so big mama q and her husband so this is um who i'll also be referring to a bit um through the course of the episode so even though i've had their pictures for a while it's just nice to kind of get this other information from ancestry.com and fill in the gaps of what i could not get from the pictures the pictures are great and i love pictures you know, I think they tell an amazing story. They're worth a thousand words, right? But when you see some of the things that are outside of the photos, things that, you know, are just recorded in history, it kind of makes those pictures have even more meaning. Now, when I look at my great grandma, and I'm gonna call her Bit Q because I'm from the South and I actually call my grandma Big Mom, but I only do that in 
the circles where I know people know what I'm talking about. So yeah, Big Mama Q. Um, she does not look happy in this picture, really. Like she looks like a tough cookie. Like you come at her wrong and she is gonna immediately let you know. And um, again, just looking at her life, now I know through doing this research that she started having children at 15 years old. She had 10 kids. She was a laborer. She was a homemaker. She was very much um, a woman who was working really hard for her family in the early days and was not easy. So she kind of has a, a tough you know, exterior. I'm sure she was a nice person. Your grandma, I feel, is a pretty nice person. And so, you know, that stems from her mother, right? My great grandmother and how she raised her. Um, but you could definitely tell just by looking at this photo that, you know, she is she's about her business. Like, don't come at her wrong. She's going to let you know. Um, just looking at how strong in appearance she looks at the age this photo was taken. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how old she was, um, but she definitely looks like, you know, she is very well built and strong. And yeah, you know, as recorded, in some documents, it said that she was listed as being able to read on some of the things that I found. And then other things, it was listed that she could not read. So um, I'm really not sure. But knowing what I know about my family history, she may have had a limited uh, vocabulary or a limited um, education. It was common for people who lived in that area where my family is from to only actually go to about the second grade. So that was probably all the education that she got. But there's some things in life that you don't actually learn from the books. You know, she knew the ways of the world from her life experiences and that in itself just also has a lot of weight. So I think that, um, She's just a fascinating person and I wish I knew a little bit more about her. So what's interesting about my grandfather is like I mentioned, I can vaguely remember him. I was a baby at the time um, when he was still, you know, alive. So we overlapped that little bit. And I'm happy that he got to kind of see his great grandchild, you know, and um I'm sure that he was quite happy about that. I can remember my grandmother feeding him. He was so old by the time I was born that, um, you know, he needed assistance with eating. I can remember me sitting on her lap and her feeding him. And I can remember him like reaching for me like he wanted to hold me. But I think my grandma was probably like, you're too old. You may drop her. <laughs> and so um, a couple of times I can remember sitting on his lap and as a baby being like a little <laughs> scared. <laughs> When you see this, you know, much older um, person and, you know, I couldn't really make out what he was saying, but it was just pure joy and happiness um, is what I can remember. So I'm happy that I have that memory of him and we were able to share that little bit of a time and overlap in time. But also what's interesting, too, is that when you start looking at these older pictures of your family members, it's like I look like them now. Let me actually go ahead and do a screen share for you. I'm going to be doing a screen, a screen share on my family tree. Um, okay. And a lot of this, once you guys see this on YouTube, is going to actually be blurred out. But if you don't have an Ancestry account, this will be nice for you to hop over to YouTube and take a look at because you kind of get to see the layout. And, you know, it is kind of tricky to learn how to use the Ancestry website. Like it's kind of complex and a little random and you kind of just don't get it at first, but the more you use it, the more you'll get familiar with it. So this is what a family tree kind of looks like. And this doesn't look like a ton of information, guys. Um, and again, this is just like one leg of my family here. Um, I could click on these icons right here um, and get a whole nother side of my family that has even more people, probably about 30 to 40 more people on it. But I'm just focusing on this um, portion for today on my dad's side, okay? And um, 
although this isn't that big of a family tree, like this took a lot of digging for me. And again, that's a generational thing. You know, um, my family history due to economic challenges and the oppressive state that they lived in, it's just not as well preserved. So it's even harder for me sitting here in 2022 to do this research (laughs) because of what happened way back then. Okay, so. Now, um, I want to kind of highlight the life here of um, my great grandmother. So again, um, we're kind of coming through, you know, my dad's side here. I can see his mother and all my grandmother's siblings here, which was nice to see because I knew that my grandmother was one of 10 and that she was the youngest. So I was able to go to some census records and I was able to see, oh, here are all her siblings that she talked about. I had only really ever known a couple of her siblings, one that lived very close by to her and another one that lived kind of in the cornfield behind our house house growing up. Um, So those were the only two that I knew. And so it was nice to see a lot of the rest of them, um, many of which are still living. I think only two of the 10 have passed away. So that's awesome. That was really a nice find to find. So now let's go back another generation and let's talk about my grandmother's mother. Now, what was interesting was I was grabbing some information from another family member's family tree. And they had this woman listed as Muffin. (laughs) And it was, it was kind of funny to see that day because you're like Muffin, like what, like what was the name there? But again, because sometimes um, there was a lot of illiteracy generationally, um, people didn't actually know how to spell their names. And so they just kind of passed it on verbally as best that they could. But then you start looking at the paper trail and realize like that was not actually their name and their name was actually spelled this way. So her name actually was not Muffin, but it actually was a very similar name um, that I could understand why this person thought it was Muffin. But yeah, so that just kind of further proves my point. Okay. So let's talk about her. We are going to call her Q. So this is my great grandmother Q that we are talking about now. And she was born in about 1908. Again, we don't have an actual birth date for her, although most um, Caucasians at the time being born in 1908, you would actually see a birth record for them um, in Ancestry.com on a census record or a birth record. But because she is a Black American or a mulatto, she does not have that information okay it's just not available she was probably born at home on the farm and that was just it okay so here's the information that I found out on her now uh if we jump over here okay on the 1930s census I was able to see that she was born in 1908 um and in 19 30, she was 22 years of age. Now, if we drop down here, and again, I'm looking at this expanded version of the census record, and I'm going to take you to the actual census record in a second. But if you look at her age at first marriage, you will see 14 years old. Very interesting. So I'm trying to just imagine what her life was like being 14 years old and married, right? That's traumatic, right? Because 14 year olds, that's way too young to be married. But that was the times. I'm sure there was an economic reason for it. Um, You know, it's just what it was. Women, young girls were married off very young. Um, They worked very hard and they had tons of women reminding you that this is the one, this is the grandmother who had the 10 kids. Okay. So she started super early. And how early did she start? When we go to the actual census record here um, and you can zoom in and it's just fascinating to me to be able to look at these old documents. Okay, so here's the old document and Mr. Census man's handwriting. Okay, and it uh, lists her here, her age. Okay, and everything that we need to know about her. Okay as well as that she was 14 at the at this 
uh, at her age of first marriage, excuse me. Now, she had some stepchildren in the home that are listed here uh, that she was caring for already to look at these old records. I mean, look at this. This is whoever wrote this in 1930, whoever was in charge of being Mr. Census person and was going out, driving out to all the homes and writing down everyone's information to just kind of see that and to know, wow, this is the information that they they gave them. And this is a piece of history. This is a moment frozen in time when, you know, they said who they were and it was written down, you know, although this isn't their handwriting, it was, they said the information to the census man. So I'm able to kind of get just a little glimpse, you know, of them just by looking at this document. Okay. Now let's uh, learn a little bit more about grandmama Q. This is great grandmama Q. So again, born in 1908-ish, I didn't have a very strong supporting document for that, um, for reasons I already mentioned. At the age of 15 and 1923, her first child is born. And again, prior to that, she had already had some stepchildren that she was caring for um, in the home that were the children of her husband from a previous relationship. Who knows what happened, you know, there. Um, but anyway, at the age of 15 in 1923, she gives birth to her first child in 1923. Okay. Now you kind of get to see some more of the, you know, things that are going on in her life. You know, it even went on to say that um, she was living um, on rented land. Her and her husband um, were laborers. She was a homemaker and he was a laborer. And right here, it says that they paid $3 a month for the land that they were renting. And that would have been $48 in today's uh, money, you know, in today's um, standards. Okay. So that is just very interesting to me. Um, and I'm sure that $3 a month was not easy to come up with. Now, interestingly, I can remember family stories of who they rented the land from, and they eventually all saved up. So it was several of them, the parents and their children, this 10 that I'm talking about. And they were able to save up money and actually buy a lot of the land that they were renting. And so I thought that was a great accomplishment for the family. And I was happy that um, they were able to do that. OK, um, now another thing that I found really interesting is that I was able to see my grandmother's birthday. And as she said, she was the last one of this big group of 10, um, and, you know, able to see her birthday here um, and everything, which was just encouraging to see. I also saw her on a census record. Uh, I want to say, I can't remember which year it was um, that the census record was from, but she was listed on there as a two-year-old baby. So just seeing your grandmother listed on a census record as a two-year-old baby, it's just, you know, takes you back to your own childhood, as well as me being a mother and seeing my little toddlers and, and knowing that there's going to be so much of a story that goes beyond them and beyond me, you know, just incredible. OK, so now what is interesting about great grandmother Q is in the family. And this goes back to what I was saying at the outset, kind of some of these mysterious stories. She like dies mysteriously. And I was so hoping that on these records, I would be able to find like a death certificate and a reason and like when it actually happened, when she actually died, because my grandmother couldn't remember when she actually died because she was a child when her mother actually passed away. And you want to know what I found, y'all? Nothing. This woman is not listed here as being deceased. There's no record of her death. And that to me is just incredibly bizarre. Of course, there is a record keeping issue because, again, one thing that I found over and over again, and I know you guys aren't able to see this, but the surnames, you know, one record, they might be spelt, you know, with two R's and, and two S's. And then you go and look on another record and it's listed a different way. But once you start putting all of the records together, you're able to kind of figure out what the name actually was. And 
I think that her death could have not been listed just because that you know of an error. It could be listed with another name and another way, and I'm I just can't figure it out. Um, it could also be that you know there were some strange instances surrounding her death because again, her husband is listed here as being deceased, which was my great grandfather. I mean, there's no. It's like I see her birth. And then no death, you know, it's just very strange. Now, in the family, there was a kind of story that, you know, she had been poisoned and she, you know, vanished. And I just it's just so bizarre. Who knows? One day with more digging, maybe I'll be able to find out some of the answers there and bring some closure to that side of the family um, as far as what happened. But as of right now, I'm just hitting roadblock after roadblock. And when you hit these roadblocks in your research, that's when you kind of like stay up till four o'clock in the morning trying to figure it out. But um, yeah, so that I all found very, very interesting. Now, um, let's talk about some more of the features of um, Ancestry.com. Another thing that is kind of nice is that it will also give you like your um, DNA story. So it will tell you like um, what, the, what your ethnic backgrounds are, um, what your DNA story is, and that's all done through genetic testing. So I definitely highly recommend um, doing an ancestry kit and getting signed onto the platform and taking advantage of that because the amount of information you get is just awesome. I've been able to find like first cousins, second cousins, like some people I knew, I'm like, yeah, I knew you were my cousin. Hey, there you are like in this database. And then other people I had no clue. So, and it's thousands of people, guys, and they all look totally different from you. <laughs> you know, a lot of them look similar, but a lot you'd be like, yo, if I passed you on the street, like I would not say we were related. First of all, we're not even the same, like overall race. And yeah, so get into your stuff. You know, if this is something that interests you, I love the DNA and science portion of this as well. Um, just kind of seeing what all your percentages are and everything. So yeah. So that part of it for me is just very interesting, you know, um, seeing what your ethnic background is and all of that. And for me, again, this is my approach to all this. Some people, um, it's really hard to go back in history. And it has been for me because I knew there was going to be a lot of holes because of my family's path with generational trauma. There were traumas that happened, as you saw, um, premature death, um, getting married off at an early age, um, having lots of kids and some very serious economic challenging times. You know, we're talking like depression era um, and all of this. So it there's a lots of trauma there. And one thing I knew was that I was going to hit a lot of brick walls and a lot of information just wasn't going to be possible, um, which has proven true. Um, but I'm happy for the bits of information that I did not know. I'm happy that I was able to find the names of my great grandmother's parents. So now my third great grandparents, I was able to find out their names. And that in itself opens up a whole new thing of um, possibilities and learning about their lives and who they were. So um, although there has been this path of generational trauma, and I know that I am so American guys, like I, on both sides of my family, we are all from one region of the South here in America. And I am American through and through on both sides. I'm like, but of American stuff. And, you know, my ethnic background is African and European. And that is me. And knowing that though, and knowing my family's path and knowing that on both sides, you know, I am the descendants of slaves. For me, it does not make me feel bad. I still love me. I'm not angry at anyone. I wish that they had easier lives. I wish that the path of generational trauma um, could have been different for them as well as for us. Um, but hey, I just choose to learn from it. I choose to educate myself and others, you know, others who don't even have my same um, 
story or my same background, just educating. That's what it's all about, learning and growing. And so um, even if it's something that's painful and, and you know that you know your family's history may have these um, very complex issues, I still would encourage you when the time is right for you to sit down and and take a look and just see what's available. You may find some things that, you know, you didn't know, you know, so um, it's been very encouraging. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, what has been absolutely fascinating is getting into this show, Finding Your Roots. And let me just talk to you a little bit about the show, first of all. So um, Finding Your Roots, if you have not seen it, it's amazing. Like it is Okay, let me just be honest, like unless you like history, you probably won't like the show. But if you are obsessed with history like me, you will absolutely love it. So what it is, is it's a documentary television series hosted by Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is amazing, by the way. And I'm going to share some information on him in a second. Um, It actually came out in 2012. And I actually remember when it first came out, I was like on the edge of my seat. I was like, oh, this is like a genealogist dream. Like, oh my goodness. So now what I want to do just to kind of, uh, if you've never seen Finding Your Roots, uh, you can listen here if you're listening on podcast, but at some point do pop over to YouTube and kind of take a look at some of these clips. You can go on the Finding Your Roots um, uh, YouTube page. You can also go to Henry Louis Gates YouTube page and he has kind of um, stuff from not just that body of work from Finding Your Roots, but also other series. He had another series called African American Lives and a couple other things, but most of them were always on PBS. So you can find um, all of that there. But I wanted to share just a couple of clips from the series because they're just so good and and they say it a lot better than I can. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoy these clips. It's dated January 6th. This is Tina Turner. And it's a labor contract. Now we've searched post-Civil War labor contracts up and down, looking for as many as we could for every guest in our series. And this is the only one that we've ever found. The only one. The said Jesse Carey, on his part, promises to furnish the above-named freedmen land to cultivate the farming tools, mm-hmm. the horses, the mules. Mm-hmm. And we, the above-named freedmen, mm-hmm. on our part, promises to cultivate sufficient grain for the use of the family and stock the balance in cotton. Right. Oh, I hated the cotton field because Mm -hmm. there were those hairy worms crawling, there were the spiders, and and also the picking of the cotton. I couldn't quite get as much in my sack as everybody else. Mm -hmm. Everyone was picking and pushing it down, and their sacks were really full, and I really wanted that. How old were you when you started? Oh, you know, I don't really remember. But what you do remember is the, oh. the cones, the, the, your hands and the cuticles yeah. and, and the sun. The sun was so hot. Hmm. Well, Tina, this document lays out the terms by which your great-great-grandfather Logan and his family would barter their labor with the white man named Jesse Curry, the same man who had owned them before the Civil War ended. Yes. So they didn't leave. They stayed, but they struck up a deal with them. Yes. An arrangement, as you know, that came to be called sharecropping. Yes. The relationship between Logan Curry and his former master changed dramatically. Instead of owner and property, they were now employer and employee. An important step towards genuine equality. This is Morgan Freeman. To his great-great-grandmother, Celie Johnson. Has a fascinating story. And his great-great-grandfather, Alfred Carr, who was white. We wondered if Celie Johnson had been a victim of sexual exploitation, like so many other black women back then. So we were surprised to see that the 1870 census for Mississippi shows Celie Johnson and her eight children living with Alfred Carr five years after the end of slavery. Going back even further, what else could records tell us about Seeley and Alfred? Well, we looked at the 1860 census for Atala County. Alfred was 60. He was laboring on a farm. Value of personal estate was $2,000, and he was born in North Carolina. Now, if you look two lines up, you mm-hmm. can see the head of household, in other words, the farm owner for whom Alfred Carr 
work. It says Mr. Andrew Johnson. And this same Johnson family owned your great-great-grandmother, Seely Johnson. So your great-great-grandfather was working for the Johnson family and living on their farm. And Morgan having children with one of their slaves. Which meant that any and all children that she bore were his. Were their property as well. Mm -hmm. now, how does it make you feel? Well, I don't know, really. Alfred Carr just stood by while Seely Johnson and their eight children were held in slavery for years. Why did she end up living with this man once she was free? We went to Itala County to examine the records. What we found was a revelation about Seely and about her family's relationship to Alfred. We discovered that in 1869, Alfred Carr purchased property with James, his eldest son, with Seely. Is that right? Then a year later, Carr sells the same piece of land to James and to three of his brothers. And when you were growing up, did your family ever? Not ever, one word. Not one word. Now, it would be certainly surprising if four very young men who had been slaves had the sum of $1,500 just five years after emancipation. Okay. Well, according to Mississippi law, illegitimate children could not inherit property from their fathers. It may be this was a way for Alfred Carr to provide for Seely and their mixed children. Really? Well, we went to the land that Alfred bought and sold to his sons 140 years ago, and look what we found. Would you mind turning the page of the scrapbook to 18? You did. Morgan, whatever the nature of their relationship, whatever it may have been during slavery times, your great-great-grandparents decided they would be buried side by side on the old car land surrounded by the graves of their children. And it's still there. It's as a Friday brother, it was still there. When we looked back at the records, we figured out that Celia and Alfred had been together for about 35 years by the time that Alfred died in 1882. Maybe that's why the person who made these headstones called her Celia Carr. Whatever her reasons may have been, Morgan's great-great-grandmother defied custom by living with this white man. Maybe this was the most important part of being free. Finally, Seely and all the other former slaves could make choices of their own. Oh, interesting, right? So that was Tina Turner and Morgan Freeman. So definitely watch those stories. Like they are amazing. Now, um, just a couple shorter clips. Like this one was pretty interesting. Something they discovered on Glenn Close. Cousin to whom I want to introduce you. Would you please turn the page? Really? You are directly related to Princess Diana. Really? Yeah. Wow. Glenn and Diana are eighth cousins. Their nearest common ancestors are Glenn's seventh great grandparents, Sarah and Joseph Strong. By coincidence, the two met at least once in person in 1989 when Glenn was in England promoting a film. She was lovely. Did you have any idea that you were, were related to her? No, but look at our hairstyles. They're very, they're very <laughs> much alike. Catherine Han, uh, they share uh, one of her DNA cousins. So this one is interesting too. Catherine too has a DNA cousin, one whose identity would expand her sense of her own. God. <gasps> what? <laughs> I am so excited. Wait, what is happening? Your mother shares an identical stretch of DNA on her fourth chromosome with actor and director Regina King. And since your mother is related to Regina, that means you are related to Regina too. Regina is about 
like an average African American, Regina is 24% European. I love it so much. This is the best. And, I love it. And Regina is, her European lines are descended almost exactly from the very same places in Europe from which you descend. So that's how you're related. <laughs> how about that? Oh my God, that makes me so happy. I, I, that is incredible. Yeah, that was really cool too. Notice they had the same eye color going on. Yeah, some of these, um, every family story is a little bit different. You know, there's some interesting stories that, you know, kind of like with Morgan Freeman's family, where it's like, you know, you can tell that there was like some humanity there. And, you know, it was, there's a little bit of perhaps a love story there. And then others where it's just, you know, blatant cruelty. So gonna press on here audra mcdonald now remember the census was taken in 1860 so edmund would have been in his 50s right while your fourth grade grandmother hannah would have been in her 40s okay tell me what you read male age 58 female age 45 wow it's such a mixture of feelings because you want to find them. I, you know, I was hoping you could get back as far as you guys could. And that's wonderful, but then it's like, and here they are listed as property. Mm -hmm. Even though you know it, and it's a part of our history, and we know it, it's, some, it's, it's interesting to see it in literally black and white. Oh, yeah. Now, here's another one that was interesting. Um, Mario Lopez. Salome Trazinha, 22, Carpenter, last permanent residence, La Paz, Mexico, Rodolfo Trazinha, 16, student, Leonor Trazinha, 21, students. Who are those guys? There's your great-grandfather, Salome, landing in the United States with his younger siblings. Oh, those are siblings. Yes, oh, wow. Rodolfo and Leonor. Did you have any idea that your great-grandfather had been to the United States? No, that's so random. How and why? Your great- <laughs> And why didn't he stay? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that one was really funny, you know, but that was a, an interesting story, too, that there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, cross-country travel going on back in those days. This one is a bit of a tearjerker. This is Maya Rudolph reacting to her family history. I cannot believe I'm looking at this. Comedian Maya Rudolph came to me hoping to explore her African-American mother's ancestry. We were able to trace back to Maya's great-great-grandfather, a man named James Grigsby, who was born into slavery in Lincoln County, Kentucky, around the year 1855. But that's where the paper trail ran out. Attempting to discover more, we searched for any white slave owners with the surname Grigsby who lived in that area. So it's a real long shot. And in the whole county, guess what? Nothing. One family. No. Could you please turn the page? Yes. <laughs> This is the 1860 slave census for a man named John Warren Grigsby. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I cannot believe I'm looking at this. This record shows that Grigsby owned 32 enslaved human beings. They were listed as was customary only by age, color, and gender, not by name. Even so, we didn't give up we began examining the ages of Grigsby's slaves, looking for traces of Maya's family. Now, you see, look closely at those hash marks. Remember, James, he would have been about five. Can you find anyone who could have been the five, same age? Five, five. That breaks my heart. I just think of my kids, so it's really hard to see. Wow, five years old. Mm. 
Yeah. Wow. I just can't believe what I'm looking at. Oh, my God. You're looking at your Where family. Their baby? You're looking at two generations of your family tree. Wow. Who were owned by that man, Warren Grigsby. My poor little boy. Jesus. It's insane. You just don't think of details mm -mm. because you don't have them. And then you and then I see five and I think of my daughter. Uh-huh. Mm. And to think that you'd have no prospect of being free. I just can't imagine. But this strange connection that it gives me, you know, it, it just makes you feel like you're part of something so much bigger. Discovering the stories of our ancestors can be a profoundly transformative experience, changing the way we see ourselves, our families, and our shared history. Amir Thompson, better known as Questlove, has one of the most astonishing stories we've ever recovered. Records show that Amir's third great-grandparents, Charles and Maggie Lewis, were born in Africa sometime in the 1820s. Now that date stood out because the slave trade to the United States was outlawed as of January 1808. After that, very few enslaved Africans came into the United States, meaning that Charles and Maggie must have been smuggled into this country illegally. Arrival of a cargo of African Negroes. Schooner Clotilda with Africans arrived in Mobile Bay today. A steamboat immediately took them up the river. On Monday, July 9th, 1860, a ship called the Clotilda arrived in Mobile Bay carrying 110 African slaves. It's the last known slave ship to come to America. Your family settled less than two miles from an area Amir, you ready for this? Known as Africa Town, which was founded by survivors of the Clotilda. I'm on the absolute last ship that ever came here. We don't know exactly what happened to Questlove's ancestors when the Clotilda arrived, but we do know five years later, after the end of the Civil War, they became farmers living close to the river where they first came ashore in America. Many of their descendants still live in that area. And thanks to them, we made an extraordinary find. You, Amir, are looking at your third great-grandfather. That is your original African ancestor, brother. That is Charlie Lewis. How? How did? How? How did you? A photo comes from a descendant of Charlie Lewis, like you, one of your cousins. That's my great 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 grandfather. That is your third great grandfather. The eyes are the same. Those are my eyes, man. <laughs> well, now you know where they came from. So interestingly, at this point in history is when you'll also see um, a lot of illegal activity creeping up because um, once the slave trade ended, when people wanted to get new slaves, they couldn't import them from Africa anymore. So then they would go up north and kidnap free black people who many of which have been generationally free, you know, several generations in this country free, and they'd be brought down to the South then um, and be enslaved um, illegally, although all slavery should have been illegal. But um, and then you will also see an uptick of um, slave breeding where um, the slave owners would deliberately impregnate as many um, of their slaves as they could so that they could, um, one, get more money for them. So now we're going to take a look at Queen Latifah. Hers was really interesting, too. I love it when we find out these little known facts.
many African Americans assume that we'll never be able to learn anything about our ancestors who were enslaved. And for a long time, sadly, this was true. But because of recent exciting advances in technology and digitization, this is no longer the case. What's more, we have to remember that not all of our ancestors were enslaved. Though every African who was brought to America was brought as a slave, roughly 10% of our ancestors were freed by the start of the Civil War. So if you're descended from one of them, tracing your family history will be far easier than you ever imagined since free people of all colors were listed by name in the federal census and on a wide variety of other public and legal documents. Frank Owens, age 40, mm -hmm. sex male. Lovey Owens, age 30, female. Now, you just met your third great-grandparents, your great-great-great-grandparents. And Latifah, in 1860, they are listed by name in the census. So what does that mean? That means they weren't slaves? That means you descend from free Negroes. You descend from free people of color. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Realizing that so many of her relatives had been spared the horrors of slavery was profoundly moving to her. It also allowed us to trace her black ancestry back into the 1700s something we can almost never do, and to reveal in the end the rarest of all finds in African-American genealogy, the document that freed her first ancestor. Being conscientious of the injustice and impropriety of holding my fellow creature in state of slavery, I do hereby emancipate and set free no way. No way. One Negro woman named Jug, who is about 28 years old, to be immediate free after this day, October 1st, 1792. Mary Old. You're looking at the moment that your family became free. I mean, what must that have been like? to get this, mm. to know this, to know that you are free. You know, on September 30th, 1792, she was a slave. Yep. The next day, she was, she free. was free. It's it's all at once ridiculous and just so important. Mm -hmm. People still think that one person can't make a difference. One person made a difference. Oh, big time. To my whole entire family line. Mary Old, one person, made a difference to my entire family line. That's crazy. So I enjoyed that one because, you know, it was nice to see um, someone um, who had you know, at some point had a slave, but then realized that that institution wasn't the right thing to do and actually set um, her slave free. So I thought that was something nice. You don't always hear um, those stories. And um, but did you catch the fact when she said um, in her paper, her document um, of freedom, where she said Jug was about 28 years of age, about so again, slaves weren't valuable. They were not treated as equal members in society, they weren't treated as people. So for me, um, it's traumatic for me because I have to sit here and try to literally figure out like how old were these people actually based on documents that I'm trying to match up and line up versus, you know, others, they kind of have a very simple, clear, it's definitive. It's like so-and-so was age 28 or they were 15. And, you know, for me, it's like a range, like it could be born anywhere between this time and this time. 
And again, as I mentioned um, at the outset, just even knowing a little bit of my grandfather's story um, before he passed away, I can recall um, my mother and her sisters trying to help him get documents together to do a birth certificate. And he was doing a birth certificate. I want to say he probably had to be like in his 50s at that time. And he was born probably um, in the mid to late 30s, certainly a time when birth certificates were, you know, like people got those and people were being born in hospitals and stuff. But because of his economic status and because of his place in society, that was something that didn't happen, you know. And so it just is very um, interesting when you start getting into it. So interesting stuff, guys. Very interesting. You know, and you discover so much about history. Like recently I was watching um, an interview with Henry Louis Gates Jr. about this show. And um, he said that when he was researching one of the participants on the show's history, he found out that um, someone in history at that time um, who was actually a slave had like won the lottery and bought his own freedom. And it's just like, I didn't even know the lottery was out back then. Like that is awesome. You know, so just uncovering things like that, that give us more of a realistic view about what history was like at the time. You got to watch this show, okay? Like you just got to watch. So anyway, so the series uses traditional gene genealogical research, written records, and genetics, DNA testing to discover the family history of well-known Americans. Genetic techniques include Y-chromosome DNA, mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA, and autosomal DNA analysis to infer both ancient and recent genetic relationships. The show's professionals typically spend hundreds of hours researching each guest, okay? Each celebrity guest at the end of the show is given a book of life, and it is basically their whole family tree, all the information that they can find. Sometimes they find photographs that are all stuff that you can sometimes get on Ancestry.com. I didn't have any photos, family photos up there. Well, actually, no, I take that back. On my mom's side, there was one photo of a family member that we discovered, which was amazing. Um, and on my husband's side, he, there were several, um, pictures as far back as the 1500s of, um, his people. Well, at that point they were like paintings, but yeah. So you never know what you're going to find. Um, so hop on there. Um, so yeah, it's just amazing to see these books, um, that each guest are presented with and you learn so much, you learn so much about what people's lives were like at that time. And again, some of these smaller pieces of history, like, you know, you may not find that out from reading a history book that, you know, there were people were playing the lottery and like, you know, 1849 <laughs> and were able to buy their, uh, freedom and things. So, um, that was probably just an isolated incident, but that that was very interesting um, to hear. So yes, that is a little bit about finding your roots. Um, they even go so far in the series to sometimes even go to the actual regions of where these individuals' families were from. And just from me watching the show, it gave me ideas of how to research my own family history. And I was able to get like more of a clear picture and like understand the stuff that I found on Ancestry.com a little bit more. So I would definitely um, recommend checking it out. Okay. Now let's talk about Mr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. So first of all, Henry Louis Gates Jr. was born September 16th, 1950. He's an American literary critic, professor, historian, filmmaker, and public interact intellectual who serves as the Alfonso Fletcher University Professor and Director of the Hutchison Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. So he's a Harvard University graduate. He's a Harvard alum. Um, he very much um, is very well connected with a lot of key um, figures in not just American history, but Black American history. And um, 
it, he he's just so cool. I love the way he narrates. I love the way that he presents each guest with their book of life and how he tells them their story. I also like how sensitive he is because sometimes they do uncover things that like some guests, they had to learn that, hey, the person who you thought was like your mother was not your mother or, hey, I'm sorry to tell you, but, you know, your family was actually still in slavery like a good 10 years after slavery had ended. So he really is good at being sensitive. He's also very good at presenting the facts and giving you such a great picture of the past. And so I really like that. And one thing I like about him that he says is that, you know, what we all have to realize is that we are over 90% the same. We're over 90% the same. He's like, when I sit down with my genetic researchers and we look at all this stuff, we go, man, look at how similar we all are. Look at how similar all of our genetic makeup is. And, you know, he said, just knowing that should, you know, make us bring ourselves closer together and be more tolerant of each other and just love each other. All right. So we've talked about a lot in this episode. We talked about a little bit in the beginning about, you know, generational trauma in general. We defined it. We, um, touched a little bit on my family. We watched the family stories of others through that series, Finding Your Roots. And so now let's talk about how this really, really, really affects all of us today, this generational trauma and how it'll show up in society and what it'll look like. But to do that, I'm going to have to, again, give you more backstory here, okay, and some examples. So let's take, for example, my grandmother, right? So her mother, as we learned, um, had 10 children and she started having kids at a very early age. So likely there was some trauma there. And then my grandmother lost her mother at a very early age as well. Now, what happened? Hmm, lo and behold, my grandmother kind of repeated a similar cycle with becoming a mother very early. My grandmother had my father at a very, very, very young age, and um, it was a bit of the birth itself was a traumatic experience for her. For example, she was a young girl, right? And um, now at this time, it was still, you know, I, I consider modern times we're talking about at this point, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, like this isn't way back in the day, right? But um, when she was giving birth to my father, uh, she told me that she was at home by herself and that they did not want to leave her, her family, but they had to go in and get the harvest in. I believe that they were picking um, peanuts at the time and they had to get out in the fields, which was really far away from from the home and get the peanuts in before, you know, the harvest time was over so they could get their money, you know, for the land that they were on and, and do everything they needed to do as farm laborers, right? And so this was quite a distance from the house where they were going. So they would actually pack up during these times and they would stay um, over somewhere or stay at someone's house that was closer um, to this area. And so she was left by herself because they figured, OK, well, you're too far along pregnant to be out there in a field with us. Hopefully you won't have the baby by the time we get back. So she said they were gone for a couple of days and she actually did go into labor before they got back. She was all by herself. This is a young girl having a baby alone. And um, she was terrified. And she said that, you know, she tried to do the best that she could. Um, she lost a ton of blood. Um, basically, they came back, her family members, um, her father at this point, because her mother was already deceased, I believe. And she and the baby were passed out in comas. So they call for the midwife and, um, you know, the midwife kind of doctored them up as best that they could. Um, she could and everything. And yeah, so then what happened there? My grandmother kind of started to develop this trauma around anything like health related or, you know, anything regarding your body and things like that. But I often wonder, you know, if she wasn't in a situation of um, being, you know, a black person in the South and not being able to get health care um, at those times, 
what her situation would have been like. You know, her birth would have been easier. She may not have been as traumatized. My father, um, that baby that she had all by herself, um, has some lung issues, some lifelong uh, lung issues. And she said that he, as a little baby, had a lot of breathing problems. He was in that coma for quite a long time. And he was always kind of sickly and all these things. And the midwife said it was because no one was there to help, you know, clear the lungs and everything like, you know, um, when you have a baby at a hospital and all everything like that. So um, to this day, my dad has these lung issues, right, that are probably due to his birth and, you know, being cold, you know, it was winter time when this happened, and they were both passed out. And they said they were both, you know, kind of cold, you know, by the time that they got there and everything. So they both almost died. It's a miracle that they didn't considering the amount of blood loss and, you know, the cord was even still like attached and everything. So pretty, um, distressing and sad, right? And so my grandmother <laughs> understandably vowed she would never have another child and she did it. And, um, you know, she kind of just shared with me over the years that, you know, it was very much, um, serious when someone was having a baby or they needed to, you know, have some sort of medical thing done because, you know, at that time, you know, Blacks were not allowed in a lot of hospitals. There was no Black doctor in the town or a white doctor who was willing to help Black patients. You was just set up, you know, whatever happened, happened. You know, if you had a good midwife or somebody who was good at doctoring, you know, that's that's kind of the way that it went. Um, and so, you know, that has an effect on people. And so even now, like with my grandmother, obviously this is like modern times, but she still has a lot of anxiety. If she has to get anything done. There is a lot of um, mistrust and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's really a challenge. So now I'll tell you another story of how this sort of, you know, almost like health or, you know, uh, trauma kind of is developing due to situations that they are in due to, you know, their status in society and everything. So my grandmother told me that, you know, a, a couple of years later, my dad is like a little toddler and they're out in the fields again and he gets bit by a snake this time. And she didn't know if the snake was poisonous or not. So she immediately again panicked because, you know, again, this is isn't like, you know, other people in society, whites and everything that if there's an issue, you can easily go get treated at the hospital in her mind. Like if this is not fixed, we are going to die. Right. Or he's going to die. And so she immediately she didn't have a car. Right. Um, because that was unaffordable if you're just, you know, a farm worker in these times. And so, again, she was by herself out there. Poor things, always alone put her uh, little toddler on her bike, rode him into town, which was a very long way. They were way, way, way out in the country. So we're talking at least probably 10 to 12 miles on her bike. She rode, got him into town, begged someone at the hospital to see him. And this is a shame because like my dad, like is not you know, that old to where you would think like this was a thing, but we're talking, you know, he's a bit older than my mom. So, you know, maybe late fifties, early sixties at this point. And, um, you know, he, she had to beg for hit for someone to see her toddler, you know, cause he had been bit by a snake. So one of the doctors did, they examined him and said, no, it was not a poisonous snake. Everything was fine. She even cut on the way, you know, she, she went by her place. She got a knife and cut his toe open to let some blood, you know, leak out because she was thinking, well, if this is a poisonous snake bite, if I can cut some of it and let the blood leak out, he may have a better chance of surviving. So, you know, that's that's pretty sad, you know, because at that point in time, you know, again, we're not talking that that long ago, she should have been able to, you know, hey, put, put the baby in the car, you know, and been seen at a medical institution without having to beg. It should not even have been a question, you know, but imagine the anxiety in her head of wondering, man, are they going to take us when we get there? Oh my goodness. I hope they take us if someone would just see him, you know? And so that's, that's really difficult. And so, you know, when you have all of these things, you know, I've kind of mentioned two instances here with my grandmother um, as this, you know, example. So she's, you know, kind of traumatized by, you know, her birth experience. And then, you know, she has this instance with her son, right. And, and yes, thankfully he was able to to be seen 
But what those kind of situations breed when you are discriminated against, you don't have equal opportunities, you don't have equal rights, um, it breeds a lot of distrust, it breeds a lot of fear, um, a lot of mistrust and fear of unfair treatment. And so when you do get into these situations, you're kind of hypersensitive, right? You're like, oh my goodness, you know, what's going to happen? And so this is how this kind of shows up in society. So for me, you know, because we're talking, you know, generational trauma, how did her stories that happened to her those affect me, right? Because we got to connect this into modern day so it all makes sense. And the way that affected me is, so, you know, I hear her stories and she's telling me all these things and it almost, it just kind of makes you kind of fearful, right? Like, oh, I may go there and they may not actually want to treat me, but they're just doing it because they have to. And, you know, I maybe someone will just say anything to get me out of their face, but they don't really want to do the digging like they would on another person to give me a real medical diagnosis. They may just say, oh, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll go to someone who has more money. I just want this person to get out of my face, you know? So, because she shared those stories with me, even as just a young child, you know, it makes you kind of, you know, have that a little bit of underlying fear if you are being treated fairly, you know, if the person who is supposed to be helping you actually wants to help you, if you will be actually be able to get fair treatment, okay? And so these are the kind of things that are, are rolling around in people's heads, you know, as big or as little as they may seem, right? Right. And again, just kind of on the vein of, you know, fair treatment and everything, you know, um, with the Civil Rights Act, a lot of people don't realize, you know, um, of course, there is there's a whole, you know, political, you know, element tied to it. But also, it wasn't until that act was passed, if I am not mistaken, you know, if I'm not mistaken, that um, anyone who was a minority, Blacks and others, were not actually allowed to draw Social Security. So they were not allowed to actually, you know, have funds saved from a check to be able to be used for future retirement, to be used if they became sick, un unable to work, versus in 1935 is when actually the Social Security, um, you know, having a Social Security number and the government holding Social Security funds back for us, that is when that all happened. But it wasn't until the 60s that everyone was able to benefit that, that Black people were able to benefit from it and others. And so when you stop and think about that, it's like, OK, if that didn't happen for a certain group of people until 1965, by this point, the trajectory is totally different for what their families are able to achieve. Because prior to that, let's say your grandmother, you know, was sick and unable to work. She wouldn't have been able to draw Social Security. So someone, maybe a child, um, you know, an aunt, an uncle, whoever would have had to stay back and not work to care for this person. So there's a financial, you know, pull that would not have been there had they been treated fairly, you know, by the government. So that is the kind of things that are on the minds of people. And these are the types of things that, you know, let's just take that. That wasn't that long ago, you know, that all those laws changed in 1965. So there's a lot of generational catch up that needs to happen. And that's what, you know, you, you just have to work through. We have to work through that, you know, so it, it's just very, very interesting now. So a lot of times, you know, they have been a lot of um, discriminations and um, unfair treatment, misjustices that have happened and really do affect people, you know, and another example I can give you of like kind of medical um, mistrust is um, the example of Henrietta Lacks. And uh, many of you probably um, know who Henrietta Lacks was. If you don't, if you've heard of HeLa cells, that is all due to Miss Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks was um, a Black American woman who actually was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And um, a researcher um, actually had harvested some of her cells and noticed that they were something there was something very different about them. They kept kind of like not dying and replicating. And um, they found this, stumbled upon this amazing discovery. And because of that discovery, 
we are able to have all of these advances that we have now, vaccines and all kinds of things have been made medically from those HeLa cells. Now, here's what's interesting about it. Typically what happens, right? If, you know, um, you go in and you get a procedure done, you know, they will ask you, hey, could we use like some of your specimens? You know, like, do you do we have your permission to do that? Now, back then at that time, I want to say most of her um, her story takes place in about the 1950s. Um that was not the case if you, you know, were black, you know, if you were white, you would be asked these questions like, hey, could we, you know, please um, use your use your specimens. But in her case, they were just taken. No one said anything to her. And it wasn't until years later, the family finds out that people are profiting, you know, from her cells as well as which they were happy about that part, making these medical discoveries and, you know, helping all of us, you know, medically with all this scientific advantage advancements that were possible because of herself, but it would have been nice to have the credit and everything. So again, that, that creates a lot of mistrust, like, Hey, you could have just asked, you know, this, all you had to do was like, ask, Hey, could we, you know, use those cells and everything. So there are reasons people have a lot of anger and fear and all of these things that, again, a lot of this stuff happened not that long ago. Like the grandchildren of these people, you know, who be like me and you, you know, we've heard their stories and, and, and seen and heard their experiences. And so it's still not as much, you know, but it still is kind of like in the back of the mind, you know, um, and everything. So now, another example I'll share with you with uh, how this could uh, turn up in society today is I can remember being a little girl uh, and, you know, just riding around the car with my grandma and we would, me and my grandma, we would have the best of time. I just love, love, love my big mom. Like she was just my everything and she still is. And uh, I mean, she's still, you know, around and everything. So I'm happy about that. And so. I remember whenever, you know, she would teach me little things like, hey, you know, if you go in the store, make sure, you know, you get a bag for your drink or make sure you get a receipt. You have to get a receipt. You don't want, you know, we could be being treated unfairly, you know, and by that she meant what was common at the time, because she lived through that whole period of, you know, civil rights was once the laws changed and everything had to be equal, there was like still subtle racist things that would happen, um, like passive aggressive racism. And um, what that would look like is she said you would go into the store and they would have to now like let you buy, you know, from the store, just like anybody else. But they would say, we're not giving you bags. So that was a way that, you know, people would discriminate against blacks was, you know, hey, sure, buy whatever you want. I'm not giving you a bag. And they didn't. They didn't have to, you know. So she said a lot of the times they would have to carry like all their groceries, take their own bags before that was like a thing, you know, like they would have to take their own bags to the store because, you know, they would not be given a bag. And same thing, like if you did not have a receipt, you know, like let's say the cashier was like, oh, I'm not giving you a receipt. They would then, you know, come out and accuse you of stealing, call the cops and say, yeah, they stole that because they should be able to give us a receipt. And of course, then you had no receipt. And so then you were thrown into jail because you weren't given a receipt, not because you stole anything. So I think it's important to kind of highlight these little, these small examples like this, because again, that turns up still in society today. So like, even as a, like an adult, like, and I have to say, guys, I've had, you know, very few like racial experiences in my life. I, I feel that, you know, I've been fortunate in that way, some way, somehow, but even, you know, those little things are still in the back of my head sometimes. And I'll give you an example. So because she told me about that bag story, you know, I just kept it there. And then when we we moved to a different state and in this state, it's customary not to give a bag at the grocery store. So it's like, hey, you know, I go into the grocery store and I keep like not getting bags over and over again. They'd be like, oh, no, no bags. I'm like, are you guys racist? Like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you giving me a bag? Like, what the heck, you know? And so then you realize like, no, this is not a racial thing. This is just in this state. Bags are not like that, that just does not come with the purchase. You either have to pay for them separately or bring your own bag, which is fine. But again, you know, that could have been a situation where, you know, someone who really was 
inflamed and, and really upset about a lot of things at that moment that could have turned into an argument in the grocery store. Like, why aren't you giving me a bag? Like, why are you treating me this way? You know? So it just, you just don't know how it's going to go. So I think it's important to hear this stuff because, you know, we just have to be understanding with each other. We just have to kind of sit back and say, you know what, this generational trauma stuff is a thing. Now I'm talking about that in regards to in this episode, like, you know, um, the black experience, right? Like, and everything, but this could show up in other ways for everyone. Like, you know, maybe in your family, there is a history of just, you know, not having a lot of money or, you know, um, any sort of mental abuse. And so even though it may have ended, you know, two generations back, there's still going to be some lingering effects in the personality, um, in the way we deal with each other out in society, um, and our thoughts and views of the world as well. And so I'm fully resolved to make sure that I am always moving forward, that I am always, you know, trying to just be an open, honest person, giving people the benefit of the doubt, while at the same time, helping people to understand, you know, everybody has a story, everybody has had their set of experiences and their family that have kind of shaped them. So it's kind of just good to always validate trauma. And just because we validate trauma doesn't mean that, you know, we're, you know, negating anyone else's experience or, you know, we are harping on trauma or giving it undue attention in our lives or in society. It's just helping us to understand each other is all I think it is. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, we we want to make sure that we're not saying, well, you know, that happened a long time ago or, well, other people have it worse or, oh, you're fine now, you know, oh, get over it. A lot of those things are true. Like, of course, you know, we, we have to move forward. Um, any type of trauma, maybe you have relationship trauma. Maybe you were in an abusive relationship, you know, Everything that happens to you is going to form your opinion about that set of situations or that thing or whatever, right? And then what's going to happen is you are also going to kind of naturally, because our, our instinct naturally is to protect our children, right? So we say, oh, we've experienced this. And these are the reasons it happened to me. So you could be on the lookout for these things in your life. And so some of those things may be right. Some of them may actually be wrong. Maybe they were just our perception of things doesn't necessarily make it, you know, 100% true. But at the same time, it was traumatizing. It traumatized and changed that person. And so we have to validate that. Then I kind of think about like, wow, like how does it make all of us feel like knowing things like this, right? Like think of some of the things that, you know, maybe your grandparents and your parents have shared with you. Think about it. Have those things actually gave you biases, right? Like they have, they have, right? Any type of trauma is going to give you some sort of a bias and some sort of a, you know, protective, you know, response, you know, you, you, you're going to try to protect yourself from having that trauma again. And they, that often shows up in the form of avoidance, you know, perhaps you're in a relationship and, you know, this type of person you were in a relationship with and you go, you know what? I do not want another person like that. And so then you want to protect your children, right? And you go, don't get that type of person. They will mess you up, you know? And so again, it affects just those, just that verbalization and that communication does affect, you know, the next generation. That's not always a bad thing, you know? So what I'm determined to do is to, really kind of get to the root causes of generational trauma and not repeat those um, things to the best of my ability. I won't be able to stop anyone else's actions if someone wants to be discriminatory or if someone, you know, wants to, you know, be unfair and all those things. There's nothing I can do about that and nor do I worry about it. But I just choose to 
be the best version of myself for myself and for my children, learn about these things, um, learning kind of the psychology behind, um, staying focused, keeping it in its proper place. Because again, you could let all this kind of crowd out everything that's good and, and just become kind of a, a really just kind of some of these, you know, injustices and things too much, you could become kind of really sensitive all the time, which sure, you know, you may have a reason to be sensitive, but regardless of traumas of any type, be that past traumas that are generational or traumas that we bring upon ourselves through our own life choices or things that were out of our control. Maybe it was, you know, a bad car accident or something, regardless of the trauma, there are ways that we can, you know, cope with it now. And we all have a bright future that we can look forward to. We all have that hope that in the future, a lot of these things won't even be called to mind. And so I think that, you know, holding on to that and keeping that at the forefront of our minds kind of helps us to put the generational trauma in its place and learn from it, but not let it affect our future and how we perceive our future. Um, it keeps us optimistic because we want to be optimistic. We want to give people the benefit of the doubt and we want to be positive people and um, positive uh, building members of society. So I think it's important to, to learn from these things and then use that information to make the future better for sure. So again, even like with the example with my grandmother and having like the, you know, birth and hospital, you know, medical kind of anxieties, right? If her experience were different because she wasn't, you know, mistreated and she wasn't, you know, a victim of prejudice and bias. And she was able to kind of just regularly go to the hospital and be seen. If she had had that opportunity, they would have known how close she was to having the baby. You know, she said she was having some mild contractions before they even went out into the field. So had she been able to see a doctor and, you know, they would have known, oh, you're close. Let's keep you here at the hospital, you know, and, and she would have had a much different experience. So then with her telling that to her grandchild, me, that would have been, oh, you know, I had this experience and I went to the hospital and they just kept me there. And then your father was born. But instead it was, oh, I was alone and, you know, I was in a coma and me and the baby almost died. And, huh. and so now it's this, she has this trauma, you know, to pass on. That's what she passed on, like her story of trauma. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what happened. But again, so then when it comes time for me to have a baby, I'm like, oh, these horrible things may happen. Ah, yikes. That was so scary, you know? And like, oh, if I go, you know, will they really want to treat me? Will they, will I be treated fairly, you know? So it really just, it, it really does affect people even today. It's just a little bit of, you know, my family history. And I hope that you're able to kind of take from this episode, hmm, just from me on this little piece that I shared with you, you know, like my grandmother, right? So, you know, I got to know that she was one of 10 and, you know, um, she herself was like born on a farm. She had 10 siblings, you know, um, it was a challenging time. And the reason was because go back a generation, you know, her mom became a mother at 15 years old, who knows what choices in life she had, you know, I'm sure that some of the choices that she had to make as a young mother, and with all these children, you know, was quite difficult. She had a mysterious death, uh, you know, she died mysteriously. So how did that mysterious death impact my grandmother, you know, and how did that impact her parenting style with parenting my father and then, you know, bringing that on into my generation now, right? And then going even beyond my grandmother and looking at her mother and her grandmother, okay? And what their lives were like, just the fact that I couldn't find very much information on them at all, being that, you know, they were the descendants of slaves um, born at the turn of the century and some in the late 1800s. It was just tough. And so again, for me sitting here in 2022 and looking back at not just my history, but the history that I can't get 
because of the generational traumas that happen due to the oppressive state of slavery. And then after slavery, um, you know, sharecropping and being laborers of land, you know, um, many of which, as I showed, you know, the names were different because as it was listed on the census records, many of my family weren't able to read. So the fact that they weren't able to read, they didn't have birth records and places all, you know, detailed out like uh, others, you know. So I think it's important for us to note, especially as women and as mothers, that this stuff matters. And, you know, we have to be a little more compassionate with each other. We have to say, hey, you know, how do we improve? Okay, so how do those traumas that were passed down generationally, you know, and that could be something so simple as being short tempered, right? So I'll share with you another little family story. My grandfather, who is uh, Granny Q, no, no, sorry, excuse me. That'd be my great grandfather. My great grandfather, who I got to see just for that little bit as a baby, and I can still remember his face, right? He was known for being so lovable, but very short tempered when it came to farming. <laughs> I can't remember the stories of my dad, you know, saying that when all the boys were being lazy, like him and his cousins, he'd be like, it's time to start farming, you know, and I remember he had like the chickens would kind of run around like in his little area, like as a baby, I could still see them chickens running. And he, but he was very much determined, like when it was time to plant them crops, like y'all better get out here and plant these crops. And so one day, as his family story goes, he got so upset that everybody was just dragging their feet. He just comes in with his pistol and is like, y'all better get up right now. Like this is serious business. Okay. So that's dramatic, right? That's like a little funny, but it's dramatic. But why was he getting so upset about the farming, like getting crops in the ground. And, you know, the way it was explained is that he understood from his generation, like if they didn't get them crops in the ground, like they were not going to eat in the coming weeks, months and weeks coming when those crops would have been coming up. And so being a black person in the South, what are you going to do? Like, your crops didn't come up, you were just short, you know, maybe your neighbor might take mercy on you and give you some of theirs, you know, but if not, you've got 10 miles to feed and like no food. So that was just it, you know, that was just it. And so now even something as simple, simple as that, when I went back and was able to like look at documents and see how much they paid for rent, how many kids were living in the house, you know, all of these things, it's like, okay, now I see why he was so upset when no one was trying to get up and get crops in the ground when he was an old man, you know, because when that story happened was when my father was a little child. So he's, you know, an elderly person at this point, you know, because he's my great grandfather. And so at this time, you know, it's like, modern you know it's probably like the 80s at this point maybe late 70s and my dad you know was able to go to the store and buy food like it wasn't like it was back then but in his mind he's like look this is serious business we got to get these crops in the ground and so they all kind of laughed at him like oh there's Paul he's acting up uh but that was the reason why that's why for him it was so traumatic that they were dragging their feet because he was thrown back to those store those times in his mind when he knew that if they didn't get those crops in the ground they were not going to eat way back in 1920 okay so it just all kind of filters together and all kind of makes sense and um yeah so ladies um I know that this episode hopefully I was able to kind of give you somewhat of a clear picture as you know with family stories and family histories it's like kind of all over the place but you know um yeah there's so much to say and I tried to condense it down um, a little bit and focus in one area but if this is interesting to you please share with me um, comment on the episode and let me know if you are interested in more family stories and exploring maybe some other portions of the family tree um, and 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 we can all kind of work on this kind of research stuff together so 
All right, ladies, thank you so much for listening to Work It Lady. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next episode. 